Now that we've talked about synchronization and synchronized methods and statements, let's talk about the other capability provided by monitor objects, which is coordination. And so I'll talk about how monitor objects provide this weight and notification, these weight and notification mechanisms that can be used to coordinate threads that are running in a concurrent program. And now we're going to use a new example, which is the simple blocking bounded queue example. And if you were to run that, you would see it behaves somewhat differently in terms of its performance, although the, the actual uh, output would be the same. So we talked about synchronized methods and statements are only a partial solution. Let's now figure out how to solve and complete the solution. So built-in monitor objects also provide this coordination capability. And this is done with the wait, notify, and notify all methods, which, as you may recall, are inherited from Java object. So every reference type, in other words, every non-primitive object in Java or every non-primitive entity in Java, field or variable or whatnot, has these methods defined in it. The semantics of wait are similar to the semantics of a wait on a condition object in that they cause the current thread to block or wait until some other thread invokes notify or notify all on that object. So it's always relative to an object. Notify wakes up a single thread that's waiting on the object's monitor, on the, the monitor condition. And notify all wakes up all the threads that are waiting on this object's monitor. So those are very similar to the signal and signal all methods in condition object. You need to be careful, of course, with the notify all, just like you have to be careful with signal all to avoid the so-called thundering herd problem, where all the threads descend, all the threads wake up, descend, trying desperately to get access to the monitor object, and only one of them will get in there, but you woke them all up. So it causes a stampede of threads, which is bad. Java built-in monitor objects only have a single entrance queue and a single wait queue. So we can kind of draw them. We can visualize them like this. You've got a critical section. You've got an entrance queue that coordinates access into the critical section. And there's a single wait queue. And when you wait, you are shunted off here, much like the waiting room we talked about in our, operating, our hospital operating system our operating system, operating room example for uh, like an emergency room that we were talking about before. This is serialization to get into the critical section. This is where you park waiting for your turn to get a chance to run again. OK. All notify and notify all calls access the entities in the wait queue. And we'll see how that works in a second. Here's an example of how we could implement put and take. Put and take are the blocking, mechanism, blocking methods that are defined in the blocking queue interface and then implemented in the simple blocking bounded queue. And you can see here that we can use wait to wait while the queue is full. And so when you call wait here, that will atomically release the intrinsic lock, in other words, the one that's this object and it goes to sleep on the wait queue. So it basically goes and puts itself, it puts itself in here. So that's the concept of guarded suspension. That's the guarded suspension pattern. You can only make progress when the condition is true, so, um, or not true. <laughs> um, so while the condition is full, we have to wait. When the condition is not full, we can proceed. Once we get access to the critical section, remember, we're the only one running in here now, we're going to add our the message to our list, and then we're going to call notify all. And that will wake up all threads blocked on the wait queue. And the reason we have to do this is because of the wacky semantics of a monitor object where there's only one wait queue. And in this particular example, we have non-uniform waiters. And we'll see what that means in a second, because we have a, two different things we're waiting on, is full and is empty. Those are two different wait conditions. But there's only a single monitor condition intrinsic monitor condition that we can use, because it's a monitor object and it's limited. So and that's the point. There's only one wait queue, and therefore we have to use notify all. You can read this. If you really want to know the gory details of why this is important, uh, take a look at this link. It walks through it in excruciating detail and shows you why you need to use notify all. Otherwise, you'll end up with essentially deadlock. 
take is used to get something out of the queue, and it needs to wait if the queue is empty or while the queue is empty. So while the queue is empty, we call wait. Once again, that will atomically go to sleep and release the lock, the intrinsic lock. That has to be atomic, otherwise chaos and insanity will break out. That's also the guarded suspension pattern. Once again, once there is something in the queue, we're going to go ahead and notify everyone that we've just taken something out and we remove the element from the queue. So this will wake up all the threads that are trying to put stuff in the queue. And again, it's because of the limitations with built-in monitor objects. Okay, so we'll come back and look at this a little further later, but I just wanted to show you kind of the big picture view of this. Java built-in monitor objects are often implemented inside the Java virtual machine or the runtime execution environment used to run Java using some type of uh, POSIX-like synchronizers. POSIX is the portable operating system standard that Linux and Solaris and many other Unix implementations typically conform to these days. And it defines C interfaces for being able to do mutexes and condition variables. And so the way it's implemented in the, under the hood is using POSIX-like features. And the entrance queue in the JVM uses a variant of POSIX recursive mutex, or they'll use a POSIX recursive mutex. And the wait queue is implemented using a POSIX condition variable. And that lets you queue up the threads waiting to, for their chance to get an opportunity to run in the critical section again. I'm just pointing it out to let you know that the implementation of the built-in monitor object features are typically at a lower level C-like stuff, rather than the way in which reentrant lock and condition object are implemented, which are largely implemented in Java, as you saw before. However, the semantics are very similar. OK. Um, and again, uh, if you look at the Oracle JDK, they use all kinds of low-level stuff to do this. But it's, it's essentially somewhat like POSIX um, semantics. The reason that they don't, they may use POSIX in the implementation, but they have to define something that can work on different platforms. OK, so that's the end of the quick discussion of an overview of the coordination features. Then we're going to take a look at more details of how this actually works under the hood in a second. So now that you've seen wait and notify kind of in the abstract, let's talk about how we could actually use them to solve our mutual exclusion and coordination problems in concert. And so we're going to start by doing a visual analysis using my super cool uh, animation prowess with PowerPoint to demonstrate what this looks like. And then we'll look at the source code in the next part of the lesson. So here's kind of what things are going to look like. We're going to have you know, our monitor object. And this is going to be the implementation of the simple blocking bounded queue. And so this is also other cool stuff. Look at my cool use of zooming in. Uh, I spent a lot of time on this. I'm not quite sure why, but it's cool. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to zoom in and see what happens when we look at this. We have a queue of threads that are blocked on the entrance queue. Those are the things that are waiting to get access into the monitor object. And then we also have a queue of threads that are waiting on the wait queue. And you'll see how those things get used here in a second. Java monitor objects implement what's called an implicit condition variable monitor. That's the type of monitor that they implement. There are other ones, of course, you can have, but that's the one. And you can read about it here at this Wikipedia link. So here's the simple blocking bounded queue. And what we're going to do here is here's the code that's actually evoking all the things to happen. We're going to have a thread. This is, the, this is the consumer thread. It's going to essentially run in a loop. And it's going to keep calling take. This is the simple blocking bounded queue implementation here. And it's going to keep, this is the test program. It's going to keep calling take on this thing. And we're going to start it in a thread. It's just going to sit there doing take, 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 take while the flag is true. So what that's going to do is if there's nobody else who's in the monitor object, we're going to get access to it. We come in and acquire the lock. And then while, now that the lock is held, nobody else can be in the critical section. While the list is empty, however, we have to wait. And assuming that we call take before we call put, that's what's going to happen, right? Because nobody's going to be there. It will, in fact, be empty. 
So what that'll do in that case is when wait is called, it'll atomically block on the monitor condition. So it'll leave the critical section, release the lock, and then it'll go and block or wait on the monitor condition, the one and only monitor condition. So thread T1 is now parked off to the side in the, the wait queue waiting room. Now we look at the producer's point of view. This is the guy who's calling put. And you can see here it's running from i equal 1, or sorry, i equal 0, i less than 10, and it's going to call put, 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 put. And what will happen when it calls the first put, it'll try to enter the monitor object, it'll acquire the lock, because there's nobody else contending it, because this guy over here who's blocked has released the lock. It will then call, you know, it'll check to see if the queue is full. Since the queue was empty, it will not also be full. So it actually doesn't have to call wait. Um, what it'll do is it'll call add instead, so that'll stick something onto the list. And then it'll call notify all. And the notify all, of course, is going to say, hey, anybody who's blocked can wake up and run. Who's blocked? This guy's blocked. So T2 then releases the lock, exits the monitor object. So T2 is now off doing something else. In this case, it's actually going to turn around and call put again. Um, and what will happen here is that will cause the notify all call will cause T1 to wake up. It will unblock on the monitor condition. It will come back around again, reacquire the lock. If there was other contention, it might have to wait in the little entrance uh, lobby here. Once it's got the lock, it comes back in. Now the queue will not be empty this time, so it doesn't have to wait. So it will go ahead and call notify all, and then it will remove the element from the uh, list, because we know there is one now, and it will return that. Notice that it's OK to call notify all before we actually remove the element from the list, and that's because the monitor lock will not be released until we exit the critical section, until we, rem we return from the closed curly brace and are able to exit that. At that point, the lock will be released, and then some other thread can come along and try to get the lock. So it's perfectly fine to call notify all before poll because nobody else is going to get back in the critical section and notice that we notified things before we actually removed an item from the list. OK, so that's the end of that visualization. Now we're going to look at the source code. So the last piece of the puzzle is just to take a look at the implementation. Now that you've seen the visualization, the code should make more sense. If the code, the reason why I do the visualizations, by the way, is that looking at the code is sometimes a little hard to follow what's happening, because there's a lot of stuff taking place sort of behind the scenes. And if you don't really understand how monitor objects are, the semantics of monitor objects are defined slash implemented, you're likely to be confused when you just look at the source code. So here's the source code. Again, we have the state to protect. We talked about that before. The constructor. You never have to put a lock on the constructor because there's only going to be called once in one thread. Although, if you were to access some global variable that might be accessed from multiple threads, you would have to synchronize that. But the constructor itself is fine. Here's how we can do the, the wait. So this is going to be the take method implementation. So thread T1 calls take, which remember when take starts to run, it acquires the intrinsic lock before it does any of the code inside the open curly brace. So you can kind of think of uh, open curly brace as being turned into a call to lock the intrinsic lock by the compiler, some byte code that'll do that. So it'll acquire the intrinsic lock, and then it'll end up waiting while the queue is empty. And assuming that this gets done first before we've put anything in the queue, that's what's going to happen. So it's going to wait. And wait, of course, will um, check to see if the condition is true or not, and if the condition is true, then we're going to wait. It seems kind of funny, but that's just the way it works. Now, the issue here is why do we put this thing in a while loop? This is really the same issue we talked about when we discussed Java condition objects. And the reason is that once you're awakened, when someone notifies you or does notify all to wake you up, you can't assume the reason why you got awakened was because the condition is still what you need it to be. Because it's a concurrent world out there, and someone else may have come along and snatched the resource before you get a chance to wake up and get it. And so we always have to make sure we check this in a loop. 
And there's a variety of issues here. This, has, this is another consequence of the fact that we have a single weight queue, blah, blah, blah. So we check things in a loop. When we're able to proceed, because the queue is no longer empty, um, then we're going to proceed. Oh, the other thing you have to watch out for, this is really bizarre, something called spurious wake-ups. And there are situations, there are some implementations of monitor objects and condition objects where even though nobody signaled a monitor object, the operating system will sort of wake you up anyway. Uh, they occur very rarely. It's sort of, uh, you know, like the probability of getting struck by lightning twice or something like that. But it is possible. Yeah, so this, the reason why you have to check the condition again is because of the non-determinism of, con of concurrency. If somebody, if one thread notifies you or others to wake up, just because you've been notified to wake up doesn't mean that some other thread hasn't zipped in between the time you were notified and the time you get the lock and the chance you get to run and stolen the resource before you got it. And that goes back to our pizza uh, delivery example we talked about when we discussed condition object. So that was take, right? When we finally get through this guarded suspension, we can do our thing and then notify gets called. Um, put is the inverse of this. When put is called, then it's going to acquire the lock, and it will add something to the list, assuming that the list was not full. And of course, in this scenario, it's not going to be full yet. So we're going to add something to the list. And is full will uh, be done in such a way that, which notice, by the way, is full is not a synchronized method. It could be, but we don't need it to be, because it is always called with the lock already held. So the uh, is full checks to see whether or not the queue is full. And if it is full, we'll have to wait. But normally, if it's already empty, it's not also going to be full. Uh, notify all gets called here, which will wake up thread T1. But it'll also wake up anybody else as well, because of the crazy single weight queue semantics of Java monitor object. Here's the remaining part of take. So when take is notified, it'll wake up. It'll recheck its condition assuming that the list is no longer empty because someone just put something into it, it'll then call notify all, and then it'll return the item. As we talked about before, this is perfectly OK, because the lock is still held, and therefore we don't have to worry about race conditions for another thread waking up after it's been notified and doing something that will corrupt the queue. It can't even get into its critical section until this curly brace is uh, figuratively hit. Samir. Yes, the spurious lake wake up, there, you'll still have a lock. It's like a magic fairy came along and you know, waved her magic wand and caused the thing to trigger a, a uh, notify. You know, it's, it's sort of like um, the virgin birth or something or the creation of Anakin Skywalker, right? It just happens you know, by midi mid midichlorian levels have gotten too high and notify is called. So it will, in fact, acquire the lock. Yes. Um, well, it'll simply have to wait until someone else has released the lock. Yeah. So it's, it's Bizarre, but it's not incorrect. So you have to, all you have to, the, the easy way to solve it is just always test your conditions in a loop, and the problem goes away. So we release the lock when we return, and we are done.